Hello and welcome to session 34 of Talking Asperger's with Andrew. My name is Andrew Marsh and in today's session I'm going to be talking about two of the key skills that people who have Asperger's syndrome possess generally. That is resilience and tenacity. And without trying to over preach here but just going to give you a quick definition of what resilience is. Resilience is the ability to bounce back from what from setbacks and to, to, to just keep getting up and keep doing it, keep trying, keep trying, no matter how many times you get knocked down. And tenacity is just keeping at something until you fulfill your goal. So the two are kind of linked, which is why we have tenacity and resilience in one session today. And I wanted to share some examples from my life, which has given you, can give you an indication of, of how I've been tenacious and resilient in being able to get through adversity. And I'm going to start with, with, with probably the worst time in my life, and that was college. I was, um, I was badly bullied. I wouldn't say actually bullied isn't the right word. It was abused. It went way beyond bullying. It was abuse. I'll give you three examples of some of the things that my colleagues on my course did to me at, uh, when I was at college. Um, we were on a field trip. There's about a hundred of us in a, a country retreat somewhere. And I was told that there was a games room on the first floor. So I thought, well, I'll go along to the games room, see what's there. The minute I opened the door and shut the door behind me, there was, there he is, get him. And I was grabbed. I was taken to the first, to the, to the window and thrown out of the window. This was on the first floor. I didn't know there was a, a protruding roof from the ground floor below me to land on. And I landed on it. I didn't get hurt, but they shut the window and laughed their heads off. That that moment of being thrown out the window was scared stiff until I saw the roof to land on. Even then, I was still petrified of what these 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 young men were going to do next. So that was the first one. And another field trip. I was tend to be field trips tended to be bad for me for some reason. Another field trip. I got set upon in my bed and they cut off all my hair badly. And on a third field trip, and yet again field trips, we were on Aaron right on the coast and they put seaweed in my bed every night the easiest thing for me to do would have been to say do you know what i'm not going to put up with this i can't deal with this i'm going to leave but leaving would have meant going back home with my tail between my legs and saying i've failed i've not succeeded and i was very much driven to succeed and get my degree because getting my degree meant i could stay from away from home i could be independent support myself get a professional job and have a career and that was important to me that was absolutely fundamental to me was having a career being able to support myself was was absolutely my number one goal and i i vowed when i was going through those difficulties at college no matter what they did how often they did it i was not going to give up on my course it would have been so easy at the end of the first year to just say, you know what, I'm not going to do this. But no, that would have been giving in. That would have been letting them win. And I can be quite a dogged little person and absolutely stick in there when when troubles are going on around me. I can, you know, like the Yorkshire Terrier that's biting on your leg. I'm just going to keep keep going at it, keep going at it until I get what I think I deserve and what I want to achieve. So those are the three very quick examples of of difficulties that I had at college and it was tough I mean it was tough I know life is not meant to be easy and you know we all learn from overcoming adversity and our struggles but this was this was beyond the pale this was taking the mick it was it was full-on abuse uh, they verbally abused me every day at college and um, but I just had this inner strength this I'm going to succeed partly because of you and partly because I want to succeed anyway, and I'm going to get my degree because that's the stepping stone to me getting a job. And, and I was studying geology, so I became a geologist after my after I got my degree. I did a master's and then uh, went on to to be a geologist for 23 years. And so that was that dogged determination. That was that I am not going to be beaten by these people. I have a right to to get my degree and to succeed. And that's what I did. That's what I set myself out to do. And uh, looking at the resilience, not the, the tenacity, not quitting, <clears throat> excuse me. I quickly realized at school when I was about 10 years old that 
I had to put myself in the right place now, do the right things now, so that in two years time, I could make the best choices of the options available to me. School works on a kind of a two year cycle. When you from when you're about 12 years old to 14, 14 to 16, and so on. So I realized that at 12 years old, that I needed to do as best as I can so that when it came to 14, and I was choosing subjects for O level and, and CSE back then, I gave myself the best options, gave myself the the the, the the, the ability to choose the best things that were, that were right for me. And so I stuck at it and I worked at it. When I got to 14, I did that, took my, got my subjects for O-levels and worked my way through those. And I could have left school at 16 with four O-levels and three CSEs. Not bad by any stretch of the imagination, but certainly not good enough to, to build a career and be able to leave home and support myself. So with the help of some very good friends that I had at, at school and and I wouldn't don't think I'd have got through it quite as well in my sixth form as uh, as I had with the friends that I that I, uh, that I developed or they they took me in really as as, a, as someone and um, I was able to study for my sixth form and I did three more O levels and three A levels and so when I finished my sixth form studies I had seven O levels I had three A levels I had uh, university places uh, provisionally for me because I'd gone through the application process. But the key thing for me was having a backup, having a second option. And at the time it was, okay, am I going to get the grades? Am I going to get two C's and a D, which is what the, all the university offers me? Am I going to get two C's and a D for my A-level or am I, am I going to struggle with that? And so with me having my, my, my planning thoughts and my backup plans, I applied to colleges and polytechnics as well. And I got an offer early on in my first year of six years, sixth form studies um, for an offer of two E's, two A levels, and I could study geology. And that was fantastic. It, it didn't mean to me that I could shirk and I could just, you know, just do minimum. But it gave me the backstop that if I didn't get the grace to go to university, I had somewhere that I could still go to college, still get a degree, which would then lead me on to being having a professional career and supporting myself. So that's what I did. And as it happened, I got two D's and an E for my A-levels, which um, I wasn't overly happy with. I, th I think I'd, I, I felt as though I could have got better grades that they didn't reflect they certainly didn't reflect all the effort that I put in for two years but they are the grades I got I can't really complain about them um physics was tough <laughs> physics was tough but it was fun physics was tough but fun um and so with my two d's and an e I phoned up the college and said I've got two d's and an e can I come to you and they said yep absolutely we'll send you an information pack and we'll see you in September, uh, whatever date it was, and details of accommodation and all the rest of it, and that was it. Off I went. I uh, sorted myself out. Went to went to Derby, did my degree in geology, and coming towards the end of my degree, I thought, well, what we're going to do for work? This was middle of the 1980s when there wasn't a great deal of employment opportunities for geologists. If I'm being honest, excuse me, just a minute. There was one obvious route, and that was to be a mudlogger on the oil rigs in the North Sea. And I didn't fancy that. I, I didn't particularly fancy that. Um, so I applied for some courses, for some master's courses in engineering geology. And I got um, I got a phone call from New Newcastle University. And they said, we've seen your application. We'd, we'd like you to come up for interview. And I was like, Newcastle University want to see me? Wow. Okay. Yeah. When do you want me? Absolutely fine. So I went up to Newcastle University, and it's just it was ah, it was a it was a different level. It was it was a wonderful experience, and there I was with the professor, the head of the department, a senior lecturer and a junior lecturer. And they we had we had a chat. It wasn't <coughs> it wasn't so much a grilling interview. It was a chat. They said, you know, what did you study? What did you do? What do you like? Um, why do you want to do this course? And uh, we talked. We, we talked for forty-five minutes to an hour. Um, my professor got up and 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 uh, he had loads of. I mean, he, he had a library in his office, as most professors do. And he got some. He had some um, 
articles which were thin sections of rock, which was one of the things I'd studied. Uh, you, you do a lot of thin section work at, at the university. And so when he said, what's that? And he, he pointed to a thin a photograph of a thin section. And I said, oh, that, that's a gabbro or that's a dolerite. And he went, oh, and he and he could tell he was thinking, oh, he's got that right. I'll give him another one and I'll give him another one. And so he gave me three or four of these and went, just pointed out them and said what they were. Um, and it and that really relaxed the atmosphere. And we just talked about things, you know, uh, what you want to do. And he said, OK, um, would you mind? One of your, my colleagues is going to take you for a tour of the department. I want to speak to the other lecturer and we'll we'll, we'll get back to you and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have some kind of decision when you come back. So I went and had a look around the labs, look around the lecture theatres and things. And I thought this was an interview for a place. It was only when I got back in the room with my professor and the two lecturers that they said, yeah, we'll give you a grant for this. You can You can come to us and there's a grant. And I'm like, I beg your pardon? I said, you've got a, we're offering you a place and a grant to study your engineering geology masters here at Newcastle. And I said, thank you very much. I'd be delighted to come. And I was like, wow, I did not expect that. I thought the interview was for a place, but it was for a place and a grant. So that was, that was a, a, a great, something I didn't expect. Uh, and I, jumped at the chance, even though doing another year of study after three hard years at, at college was probably not the wisest thing to do. Um, there weren't the jobs that I wanted. Uh, employment for geologists, as I said earlier in the mid 1980s, wasn't fantastic. So I took it. I took the master's. I, I managed to get my master's. And after that, I got a, a, a job as a geologist and that started my career. But that was that was an example of me not giving up and my dream, my goal. My goal from when I was about 14 years of age was to leave home, be independent, have my own life and support myself. Doing my studies for O-level, for A-level, for my degree, for my master's, that all put me one step closer to being able to do that. So that was, that was the dogged resilience of sticking in no matter what happened, of not giving up, just keep fighting, keep working keep having that goal in mind that when you when I had the difficult times and my master's was was tough um, when I was going through tough times in that and, and some of the subjects were difficult I was thinking you've got a goal you've got to do this keep working keep plugging away keep going at it and and eventually I got through that and 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 I got offered a job uh, well actually when I finished my master's I didn't have a job so I I stayed in Newcastle I I I rented a room in a house uh, from a lady and the only thing I could get just as a stopgap was a work as a barman in a nightclub in Newcastle. So, so if there's people my sort of age thinking, I recognise him. Yeah, I was a barman in a nightclub in Newcastle for about four weeks, five weeks. And then I got offered a job in Glasgow and they phoned me on a Thursday night and said, you can have the job, but there's one condition. You start Monday morning in Glasgow, make it happen. And I'm like... OK, um, I've got to give a month's notice to my landlady. I don't have anywhere to live. But I found ways around that. I did. I was going to work that Thursday night and I had to effectively resign that night and say, hi, boss, thanks for giving me this job. But I've just got a professional career job starting on Monday. This will be my last night. Is that OK? And he went, yeah, OK, that's all right. So it was really kind of him. So that was just another way of working out, working at something and plugging away and keep focusing on the goal. When times are tough, absolutely focus on the goal. What do you want to achieve? And what did I want to achieve? Which, as I keep saying, independence, support myself, have a career. And that's what I did. And uh, and that's that's part of the thing, the, the, the traits that people with Asperger's have. Not all of them have it, but it's, it's one of the, the common traits that people with Asperger's have is tenacity and resilience. So when you're in work and things are going, things are tough and you've asked them to do things and, and stick at it, that's what they will do. They will work hard. They will stick at it. They're given the job. They will absolutely give their best for it and give 100% and work hard at it. If they've got questions, they will eventually ask the questions. Sometimes they ask the questions quite soon, but they will ask questions, but they want to try and fathom it out themselves first. But then if they don't, if they can't quite work out which way to go, they will ask questions of their boss, their manager, their supervisor, 
and given that they will crack on and work at it and and work hard at it and and that's how that's how they do it they they they're doggedly determined to to achieve what they've been given to do they will do it to a good standard and they will work hard at it and if yeah there'll be things that come along that trip them up there'll be and, and one of the one of the biggest challenges that, that i have is change is when people make change I'm just going to make a note of that because i've got an idea for a post but when people when you're given a job to do and you know how to do it you're, you're you're cracking on with it and someone comes up and says oh we're going to make this change and it fundamentally changes how you approach the job it's like the last two weeks of what you've been doing is now irrelevant that having to make changes for for someone else's reasons for reasons that aren't immediately apparent and immediately obvious but you just have to go along with it your boss has said we need to make this change so how much how much can we reuse of what you've done so far and how can we adapt what you've done so far and modify it or is some of it redundant and you have to start from scratch again so that making change to something when i was working on it is something that i really struggled with and because can't we tie these things down better beforehand can't we define what we're doing and and, and you do you know in in working as a geologist you have a brief you know what what your client wants but sometimes things happen and things make changes it may be that if you're working on a a, a major roads project major scheme like that that 13 kilometers of road are worked on in m74 in uh from gretna uh, from well from ecofecken to kirkpatrick fleming which is just north of gretna so things are going to change in, in a scheme of that magnitude and you just have to accept it and move on and to see what you can reuse and, and adapt and, and move things forward. So these sorts of things can be challenging and, and change is one of those things that I struggle with, particularly if I can't see the reason for it or I don't necessarily agree with the reason for it. Change just because your boss has decided to do something different. That's that's not a valid reason to make change just because They've seen they've seen you do something and they've decided they want something different. Well, they should have been more specific in what they wanted. I, I've worked for for a number of people over the years who don't know what they want. They want something done. They want something done in a in a in a, of a certain nature, but they only don't realise that what that what they don't want when you've given them something. Now that sounds a bit contradictory, but they don't know necessarily know that what you've given them isn't what they want until you've given it to them. Rather than saying, being more clear, be more specific, be more precise, which are three words that I keep coming back to in my uh, webinars, be clear, be specific, be precise. If you just say, do a report on that job, well, okay, I'll do a report on that job. If you're not specific and precise, then I will do what I think you mean. I'll do something on the basis of what we might have done before, what I think is the best approach. Give it, give it to your boss, and they'll go, well, I didn't, that wasn't what I wanted. That wasn't what I meant. Well, you weren't specific. And that's time, that's time wasted. That's fees wasted. That's effort wasted. And those those kind of things really do great with me when people can't be clearer in what they want, what their objectives are, what what you know how they want things presented a, a lot of the times changes were made just for the sake of making changes to make things look different and, and, and present something in a different way uh, so changing drawings or changing appendices and, and including different photographs when you've when you built your report around certain photographs that you've made because back in those days in the in the 90s when i was working we didn't have computers like we have them now like i'm talking to you on my laptop if we wanted photographs in a report we would actually physically take the photograph in a camera on a film take it to a developers develop the film bring it back yes these are the ones i want so you then say right i need some negatives i need 12 copies of these three photographs for this report you would then go back to a, to the developers and say i want 12 copies of enlargements of this size then you would then stick them into the report on on the paper on the card that the report uh, the photograph is being mounted on nowadays you can just click photograph insert image change the size by dragging the corner and that's you done title at the bottom back in back in those days there was a laborious process of including photographs in a report 
there was lots of processes to go through. So if the boss said, I want to change that, you know, this is, you know, three o'clock on Friday and he wants changes and that means changing the photographs, you've got to suddenly show him all the other photographs, go down to the developers and say, can you expedite 12 copies of these new photographs in an hour or in half an hour? And then you go back and you've got the, all the reports are all copied. You've got to then insert all the palaver of doing all of that just because someone changed the changed the nature of what they wanted to be enclosed. I say that nowadays it's not so bad because you we've got computers that can we deal with it in that way. But those kind of changes, they really grated with me and I found them difficult. And sometimes I would say, you know, why, why are you making these changes at this such a late stage? Well, I didn't see what you'd done until you'd done it come on you know let's let's have better communication next time let's let's sit down next time when we're doing something let, let's sit down and go through it in a bit more detail a bit more precise what exactly you want so that i can do it right first time if i can do it right first time it's going to be quicker and cheaper and easier to do it's less hassle less angst and less uh uh anxiety for me knowing not knowing whether you're going to like it or not um and so we, we deal with things like that. So those kind of things that you have to deal with are just part and parcel of business, they're part and parcel of work, but they have knock on effects. And back in those days when you had to do reports manually with enclosures and insertions and photographs and, and drawings that had to be copied, all of those things took time to compile and putting them all together into a report was not an easy, as easy as it is today when I say we can just click and drag what we want into something and uh, and take it from, so things were different back in those days and those brought different challenges and they had different consequences as well. So that's where you had to be quite, quite determined, quite resilient to stick at something and uh, just, you know, address everything that came up as and when it came up and produce the finished product at the end. So that's what people with Asperger's who, who will do when they're, tenacity and resilience they're very dogged they're very goal focused they will absolutely put their effort in to achieve the goals and their their goals will be the project goals but they're also goals so they will have their goals for for six months and a year they'll be looking for progression and advancement you know in two years time i want to be up for promotion so they will work at it they will deliver good work so that they can get promotion be seen to be doing the right things for the right people and so they will have plans in in place to say okay it, after this year, length of year service, I want to be at this level. Five years beyond that, I want to be at, considered for that level. So they will have a plan. They will have a career path that they will they will be wanting to follow. So that's that's their tenacity. That's their resilience. Doing what is necessary. Doing what is needed to be done to be able to be in that position. As I said, when I was a kid, 12, 14 year old, what do I have to do now so that in two years time, I can make the best choices of the options available to me? It's just the same at work. What do I have to do now so that in two years' time I can be up, considered for promotion uh, or additional responsibility? So that planning, that forethought, that dogged responsibility, uh, dogged determination are all things that people with Asperger's syndrome have, and it's great for business. Businesses need people who will get stuck in and get on and do it. And if, and if that means they need to stick around a bit longer from time to time, then they will do that and they will get on with it and they will produce the report or the deliverable so that everyone knows it's done on time to the right standard. So that's what you get with people with Asperger's syndrome. They're dogged, they're resilient, they'll stick at it, they're tenacious and they will put the effort in, but, ult but eventually they will want the reward that comes with that. So if you employ people with Asperger's syndrome, they have a number of traits and characteristics that they are good at. There are things that are challenging for them, absolutely. And I've given you one of them in change. Change management is one of my one of my uh, biggest challenges. My my other biggest challenge is people, because people don't say what they mean. They don't mean what they say. But that that's for another topic. So if you're an employer and you want to know more about some of the key strengths of people with Asperger's syndrome or autism. I would welcome the opportunity to have a chat with you. I offer a free consultation for half an hour where we can explore how I can help you and whether any of my coaching programs or my core online courses are right for you or whether I can come and speak to your organization uh, over a lunchtime or an afternoon session where we can 
we can discuss and explore the, the positive benefits of employing people with Asperger's, because as it says on, on the screen behind me, your Asperger's staff are your Asperger's superheroes, and they will absolutely can be absolutely fundamental to moving your business forward with new ideas, innovation, and their dogged determination to see something through to a conclusion. So that's all I wanted to cover today. Thank you very much for being on board. And I say, if you uh, want to know more about me and uh, what I can offer, you can find them on my website, which is aspergersmatters.com. Uh, or if you want to email me, it's andrew at aspergersmatters.com. And I look forward to hearing from you. So look out for Friday afternoon when I'll be posting what next week's webinar will be about. But until then, thanks for your time. If you're watching this on replay and uh, you want to ask him any questions then feel free to get in touch through the website or the email address but until next week thank you very much and take care goodbye <laughs>